Don's being dilatory in rounding up the flock, but I will go ahead and get started. I w will not be as long as some other people. I, you see, I believe that, that in any presentation, you should be, I should be organized so that I can say things once and be done with it, and your time is sacred. So I'm organized. Now, I have a, uh, I have a website, and there's an article in it called uh, Digital Theology, and the theme is that if you can count to the number two, you can go to heaven. And so this precludes most people who have a modern education, because I don't think they even teach counting to two anymore. But if you're going to understand the Hebrew mind, if you're going to understand the Bible, if you're going to understand God, you need to think like a Jew. And the characteristic of Jewish thought and philosophy is repetition. They do everything twice. They, uh, it, it extends from their poetry. And the reason God does this is because he wants his poetry in the Bible to translate into all languages. And if it's based on rhyme, it won't translate. But if it's based on repetition or parallelism, as they call it, then it can translate. And what you do is you say one thing, and then you say the same thing in a slightly different way. And in this way, you uh, emphasize, you ingrain into the memory, and you, you basically make your point in uh, a, a special way. And in addition to literary parallelism, there is parallelism between the testaments. Uh, what God does in the Old Testament, he does something in a particular, limited, historical way, and then he does it again in the New Testament in a way that is universal, spiritual, and permanent. And we see this time and time again where things are sort of enacted once, and then there's even more than a recapitulation. There's a, uh, there is a repetition of it, but in a way that counts for eternity. And so what I want to talk about today is how the Exodus is really an allegory for uh, Christian redemption, how God redeems. An allegory is a story where each character has a special meaning. Uh, C.S. Lewis is the master of allegory with his stories and so on. And so uh, what I want to point out is that the the... Exodus is in fact an allegory where just about every element has meaning for us. The first element is that we are all born into sin, just like the Jews were in Egypt. Egypt is an allegory for sin, and the people were enslaved. This is what the Bible says. It says we're enslaved by sin. We think that we're free. We think that we have willpower. We think that we have choice. And in fact, what the scriptures say and what experience teaches is that we're all really born into sin and we, we can't do anything about it on our own. This is uh, what I call powerlessness. Uh, we, are, we have two problems when we're born. We're, we're, we're guilty. People say, I feel guilty. Well, good. You are. I am. We're all guilty. And second problem is that we're powerless to do anything about it. We, we, we realize we're sinful, we confess our sin, we get forgiveness, and then we go do it again. And there's a vicious circle that many people, especially Christians, are in when they don't really know how to operate in the power of the Spirit. But anyway, we're powerless, we're, we're born in Egypt, as it were, in sin. And then uh, we have the Passover. And with the Passover, we've got... Uh, the, the Hebrew people, the, the Israelites, being delivered from the power of sin and that the penalty for sin, which is death, was visited upon the Egyptians and not upon them. They were delivered from sin by Passover. Uh, as soon as they were delivered from sin, they passed through the Red Sea. And elsewhere in Scripture, it points out that the Red Sea, Red sea is a metaphor for baptism. You've got water, and they, they pass through, and it's sort of a celebration of what has just happened. Uh, the, the, the Pharaoh and his chariots chasing them. By the way, when we were uh, much younger, and our oldest son, who's now 30, 38, 
uh, when he was a kid, he would watch that version of the Ten Commandments that has the Exodus with the water standing up. Was that Burt Lancaster? Charlton. Charlton, excuse me, I've got my wrong <laughs> wonderful guy. Uh, he would watch it over and over and over again. Uh, and really the passing through, uh, the, the Pharaoh and his chariots represents uh, the, the devil and his minions coming back to remind us of what we've left behind. All the, the sinful acts and behaviors that uh, we were addicted to and liked, uh, they're chasing. And yet uh, baptism is supposed to be two things. It's supposed to be a celebration of what has already happened looking back at our forgiveness, our justification in Christ. And also, it is a, a sign that we have made a break with our past. Uh, from God's perspective, it's us in Christ. From our perspective, it is we have been crucified with Christ. But this, I'm getting ahead of myself. But with every sacrament, there is a God side and a man side. And, and the p passing through the water represents... Uh, the things that bedeviled us are being left behind and defeated by God on our behalf. So they end up in, on the other side of the Red Sea, and they're immediately given the law. They, they go to Mount Horeb, and Moses goes up, and as we heard today, uh, 40 days and nights on, on Mount Sinai, uh, he, we are given the law, which told us what to do, but did not help us do it. This proves that we need more than just information. We don't, just telling us what we're supposed to do doesn't help us do it. It's, we, we all know what that's like. You see, uh, wives, when you tell your husband what to do, that's, uh, do, do, that's not enough, is it? They know. This morning I ran, I jogged in a nice J. Crew t-shirt. And I was reminded for the umpteenth time that I'm not supposed to do that. And uh, so, women, it's not enough just to pass on knowledge. We also need help from, from God. We're given, they were given the law, and then they were told to take possession of the land. They were told to go up to the Holy Land, remember? And what did they do? They had a bad report. And they did not do what they were told to do. And this represents sins of omission. As it says in James 4.16, it says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is for sin for them. And if you listen to me for very long, I will tell you that we are going to be judged not for our sins. Our sins are not brought up at the last judgment. What's brought up at the last judgment is, were you, did you do any good? Okay, you've been forgiven. Now, having been forgiven, having been offered the power of the Holy Spirit, did you let him do good things through you, or did you not? And so, uh, this represents the sins of omission. They would not do what they were told to do. And then, once they realized their, their crime, then, when they were told to not go, what did they do? They went anyway, and they were beaten back. And then the Lord said, this generation, this sinful generation, will wander in the desert for 40 years, a full Jewish generation, until all the guilty died off. So they wandered, and then they were told to go up and take possession of the promised land. But who was not allowed to go? Moses, that's right. And that's because the law can't get you into the promised land. He was excluded. He was told to go up on Mount Hor, and he could look at it. You see, the law is to give you a glimpse of the life of the Spirit. It's to give you a glimpse of fellowship with God. But you, it cannot deliver the goods. It cannot help you because it is external to us. The law is imposed from without. It's right. It's true. It's correct. It represents God's moral law. But because it's external to us, it can't really help us. So the law can't get us in. Moses can't go over, and instead it's Joshua. And Joshua is a variation of the name Jesus, which means God saves, and it is Joshua as a um, metaphor for Jesus who is able to take the Jews into the promised land. Now, 
Uh, the promised land uh, represents variously the church or the life of the spirit, but it represents living in God's favor, in communion with God, and in uh, having that fellowship restored that we had in the garden originally. And the Jordan represents the dividing line between the old covenant and the new. They had to cross over the Jordan to get into the, the church, if you will. And as soon as the Israelites do enter the Holy Land and cross the Jordan, what were they told to do? Come on. This, this is... This is well, they were told to make stones, take stones out of the Jordan and put them up there, but they were told to get circumcised. Okay, now, this is the only sermon you're ever going to hear on Gibeoth Ha'alarath, which means hill of foreskins. Okay, this is the only time you're going to get this. Right, Don? <laughs> and what, this rep what circumcision represented was the removal of something that stood between the people and God. To get into the church, to get into fellowship with God, once again, we must seed our will. Our will is what stands in the way of obeying the Holy Spirit. See, for every convert, there, there's a battle that takes place. The minute you become a Christian, the minute you start going to church, what happens is the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you now. There's a Pentecost, a personal Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit is telling you what to do. And then, the, and that's, we're in Christ legally because of Good Friday. He is in us effectually as of Pentecost. And um, he, he starts to contend with our will. The first thing he runs up against is our, our will, our desire to do what we want to do. And so it is only in seeding our will and obeying him as Lord that we have the power to get out of that vicious circle I talked about earlier. See, the law can tell us what to do, but it can't help us do it. Only Christ in us can help us do it. Now, I, I don't want to imply that any man has ever uh, let his natural inclinations get between God and himself. But that's exactly what this means in terms of requiring that they be circumcised. Uh, circumcision is supposed to be of the heart. And the circumcision of the body was just a metaphor. But in, um, let's see, it's in Genesis, or it's in Deuteronomy. Where is it? It's supposed to be in my notes here. Um, it, it says repeatedly, it's in Jeremiah, it's in Deuteronomy, and of course it's in, in the New Testament that, that this is a metaphor for the circumcision of the heart, namely that our, we're supposed to be given a new heart. It says of Saul, it said uh, he was given a new heart, the first heart transplant, if you will. And that is required to go into the church or the life of the spirit, which represents, is represented by the, the uh, promised land. Now, what we see is that this does apply to us today. This applies to the world. Because, again, I will tell you that all are forgiven. Uh, the blood of Christ cannot be limited. Uh, the, our sins, it says in the, in the communion service, the sins of the whole world were covered by the blood of Christ. And all attempts by Christian theologians, especially John Calvin and his, uh, his ilk, are attempting to explain how grace can be limited, how the blood of Christ can be limited. And I don't believe it can. But what does get you in trouble spiritually is that once forgiven, you need Christ in you to do good because the second judgment is not on sin but on fruitlessness. It says the axe is laid of the root of the trees that do not bear fruit. John the Baptist says it. Jesus says it. The, all throughout the epistles, it says the same thing. We're judged by whether or not we're bearing fruit. And... Uh, Yet there are many people who say that the price of entering the promised land, the price of having our uh, hearts circumcised is too high. They will not allow that. See, you were forgiven without Christ's, w w without your permission. I love it. Who's our, who's our new curate here? Jesse Barklow said, if you don't like being 
uh, the fact that you weren't consulted on being forgiven, you weren't consulted on being born either. You, you were born without your knowledge, consent, or, or, or permission, and you were also forgiven, included in Christ on the cross without your knowledge, consent, or permission. But to have a personal Pentecost and to have Jesus come and be your Lord does require your knowledge, <clears throat> consent, and permission because it means you have to go through this process of, of seeding your will. And so many people are standing at the banks of the Jordan. In fact, this is all humanity who aren't Christian. All humanity who are not Christian are standing at the banks of the Jordan saying, I will not cross because the cost is too high. I will not cede my will. Oswald Chambers says, The Spirit of God has spoiled the sin of a great many, yet there is no emancipation, no fullness in their lives. This describes many people, even nominal Christians, who have supposedly <clears throat> given up uh, certain things and consider themselves to be uh, you know, good people. We've all heard that. But in fact, they are not letting Christ operate in their lives because they have not fully seated their will. Here, here are those citations. Deuteronomy 10, 16, Jeremiah and Paul all say that uh, it is to be a circumcision of the heart. See, all leave Egypt, all the Jews left Egypt, all were forgiven, not all entered the promised land and are saved. Again, Paul makes a distinction between justification, forgiveness, and salvation, which is uh, playing host to the Holy Spirit. Uh, the ones who fell in the desert are those who today benefit from Good Friday, but who disobey God and refuse to experience Pentecost. The Passover was the beginning of a journey, a journey I've just described. The end of the journey was the Feast of Weeks, which became known as Pentecost. And the idea is that here you're getting out of Egypt with the Passover, and here with the Feast of Weeks, which is only instituted once they got into the Promised Land. There you are harvesting the fruit of the land, you're leading a settled existence, and your journey is over. You're bearing fruit and rejoicing in the fruit of the land. So Pentecost finds its, uh, excuse me, uh, the Passover and, and Feast of Weeks are the Old Testament metaphors. The New Testament metaphors that correspond exactly are Good Friday, again, our sins are forgiven, and Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes in and bears fruit through us. And so for many people, in the world, especially nominal Christians, they have experienced, they have benefited from Good Friday, but they've never benefited from Pentecost. And they're standing at the shore of the Jordan River on the banks, and they're saying, I won't go in because it hurts too much. It can happen to them then, and it can happen to us today. So let us be people who do cross the Jordan, who cede our will, who submit to the circumcision of our hearts, and thereby uh, do not contend with Jesus as, as Lord. In fact, make him our Lord so that he can bear fruit through us. That's the story of, of the Old Testament and the New, how God takes that which is sort of temporary and localized and historic and makes it permanent, universal, and spiritual. Any questions or comments? It was so clear, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so what is the Jewish way of fruit-bearing? Good question. Fruit-bearing means that you are doing what Jesus would do were he here. Because that's his plan. You see, when he was crucified... He then was gone. He was, he was in hell for three days. He was missing. But he was then resurrected, and after his resurrection, he appeared to people, but he could only be in one place at one time, right? And so then he ascended, and there was Pentecost. And the whole idea of Pentecost is that he is coming back, sending his spirit upon all who obey him so that 
we will do what he would do were he here. He can now be everywhere in the world at all times. Because where you are, he is. And it's God's plan to redeem the entire creation that way. And so fruitfulness means you are waking up every morning and saying, Lord, uh, please introduce me to people who need to meet you. Please help me be an agent of reconciliation in the world. Uh, especially lead me to uh, bad people, evil people, hostile people, because I, when, when you lead bad people into my life, I know, aha, this is you showing me that they're in spiritual need. And you are showing me, you're giving me a compliment that you know I'm gonna respond correctly to these bad people. And I'm going to intercede for them and I'm gonna be as Christ to them that they might see you and see instead of retaliation, you will see uh, constructive interaction. I'm not saying tolerance, I'm not saying con condoning evil, but I am saying a right response to evil. And that's a sign that God is bearing fruit through you if he is letting you have a rough time in your life. I hate to say it. It's like we had... Excellent point. Um, I will go so far as to, I hope Don's not listening. No, I will go so far <laughs> as to say that every good deed, every act of mercy, every um, triumph of the conscience over the flesh in all people in the world, regardless of whether or not they're aware of the Christian gospel, the, the question is always, what about Eskimos who've never heard the gospel? Well, actually, the Eskimos have largely heard the gospel because there was an Anglican, an Episcopal archdeacon of the Yukon, Hudson Stuck, who ministered to all the Athabascans and the Eskimos in, in Alaska. Mm -hmm. That's an aside. But I believe that, that independently of a, a specific administration of the gospel, that all good things are Christ doing it in us. Okay, I, I think that the Mohammedan, whose religion is, is complete baloney, I'm trying not to not cuss here, <laughs> even the one who shows mercy is in fact, Christ is animating that. He is not limited by doctrine. Doctrine is excellent. I am the biggest theologian here because I believe doctrine is important. But I believe that Christ can work through people and do acts of mercy. And if you look at the scriptures, Jesus doesn't say, those who have precise doctrine will go to heaven. He says, those who are merciful to their fellow man, who reflect the mercy they themselves have received from me, those are the people whose heart is good and who will bear fruit. So, excuse me? Well, well, no, no, I, I, okay, I, I, this is a gray area and I'm not God and I don't know, but it seems to me that if you have the spirit all people are offered the Spirit freely, but not all people see their will and their will is contending with the Spirit and pushing him out. And I believe what, what it says in the scripture is that if you do this long enough, this, the Spirit will leave. In 1 Timothy, Paul, uh, Paul says, Jesus is the Savior of all and particularly of those who believe. And to a Jew, believe doesn't mean assent. It means I obey. Uh, belief means obedience. And so the people who are standing on the banks are people who refuse Jesus as Lord. They'll take him as Savior, but they won't have him as Lord, and they will be in trouble at the last judgment. I hope that helps. Yeah, just think, two, two women I'm related to here. Go ahead. Anne. <laughs> I, 
I don't even have to comment. That's ex very true. Well, okay. I'm just helping you interpret your life. Yeah. No, it's not. It, yeah. No, he does, and that's why he gives us Sundays. He gives us Sundays to encourage us that there are other people like us who love us. By the way, everyone's been very nice saying, where have you been? Everyone's very nice. This is such an encouraging place. It wasn't that fun because they, t they looked at me and they said, Robert, you ski like somebody who learned to ski in France 45 years ago. <laughs> and I go, well, I did. And they go, things have changed. And they completely dismantled my skiing and uh, corrected me. I mean, it's just, they g even gave me skis. This guy gave me some skis. He says, you need these. Those things on your feet are too long. This, so, and, no, you're, it isn't just... Bad. Bearing fruit is fun. It means that life's an adventure. And every day you get up and you have no idea what God is going to do through you. But it means it, the number one need of humans is not food, love, passion, any of those things. The number one need is significance. We all want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And that's why young men go to war and why old men go to church. Because... <laughs> We want to be part of something bigger. And the way to do that is to let Jesus operate through you. And as Oswald Chambers says, he says, if you, if you put yourself at God's disposal, you will bear fruit in ways you had no idea until the, the, the summation of things in, in heaven. Then you will see the fruit that you've borne. In fact, Oswald says you often, God won't let you see the fruit you're bearing because he doesn't want you to get a fat head. No, God won't let you see it because, again, he doesn't want you to... Uh, you, do, you, you do the things you do every day because you love God, not because you're going to get something. He hates that mercantilistic attitude toward the Christian life. That's prosperity doctrine. Uh, he, he wants to help yourself to himself to your life so that he can work through you, and he deliberately keeps you guessing uh, because... Look at, look at what happens with successful ministries. Successful ministries often founder when the guy's sort of too good. And uh, There was a guy up in Aspen who used to go to a Ted Haggard, I think, uh, ministry. And he said that after church, they would all go to Golden Corral or wherever they went. And they would talk about how good the sermon was and how great a preacher he was. And then there was a downfall. You see, because you're not supposed to go, hey, our preachers in every Fundy church, our preacher's so good. Well, the focus is on him, not on Christ. Now, I'm not saying that you should be a bad preacher. You should be organized, and you should know what you're talking about. But, as, as Oswald Chambers says, the true fasting of a pastor is from eloquence. No, it's the Lord's. And you see, you see, Pelagius was a, a, a fourth, fifth century, whatever, Anglican monk who said, you can bear fruit without the aid of the Holy Spirit. And he was justly anathematized at the Council of Carthage or something like that. Um, it is, this, the way you get over works righteousness, and you're not a Roman Catholic, is that it is in fact Christ bearing fruit through you and it's not you doing it. You're, you're just... Well, that, and, and he gets all the credit. He gets all the credit. At the end of the day, he says, uh, we are only unworthy servants. Yes. The fig tree? How's that? 
Well, he went to it. That's, that's a funny uh, metaphor there because the fig tree represents Israel and Israel wasn't bearing fruit. And it says, but it wasn't the season for figs. So why is it the tree's fault if it wasn't the season? The season was when Christ came, I guess. But yeah, that, he curses things that don't bear fruit. Yeah. It's he doing it. Yeah. 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 Your, your responsibility is to remove hindrances from the life of Christ in you, and then he will do all the heavy lifting. And that's when it really gets fun, when you start to see things that you didn't plan and you didn't orchestrate, and yet they're happening anyway. One of the things that I said to the church in Aspen is that, because there are two churches in Aspen, basically. There's a Fundy church, and there is the Episcopal Church. And the, the other ones are sort of on the skids. Uh, Aspen has its own set of demons, trust me. Um, and, but uh, one of the things I wanted to point out to these people in the Episcopal Church, which is a lovely congregation, they, they have elements that fundy churches don't have. And the reason you go to a historical liturgical church is because we both have the liturgy of the word, which Fundy churches have. You know, they'll, they'll talk for an hour or two on the scriptures because they're not organized. But we also have the liturgy of the table. And so what we do in the liturgy of the table, the second half of the service, is that is the discipleship component. That's where what was public, the public preaching of the word, now becomes private. It's you and Jesus. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go kneel at the altar and say... I need Jesus in me. That's the whole point of the Eucharist. You are nourishing the life of Christ in you, just like your body needs food repetitively. Our spirit, the spirit of Jesus in us, needs to be nourished repetitively because we leak. And so we're, we're to kneel down and we're to conduct business with Jesus personally, and we've got that, and the Fundy Church doesn't. Jesus didn't say, go and evangelize all the nations. He said, go, go disciple all nations. And we've got both. And so I wanted the church up there to realize that you've got something unique that God values, and he is going to preserve in Aspen if you will let him, and if the bishop lets you. Uh, the, the, this is the challenge of the churches, because the Episcopal Church typically has lost the liturgy of the word. They don't preach the Bible anymore. They go, oh, well, here's this ancient document, but you don't have to do what it says. You know, that's nonsense. 
but I want you to know there's a reason you come here and there's a reason God's blessing this church and there's a, something we're offering in Colorado Springs that you're not going to get in most other churches. So keep coming and let Jesus do the work through you. Okay? Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you.